Well, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here and uh, talk a little bit about failure of reverse total star arthroplasty and whether you should uh, do a one-stage or two-stage revision. These are my disclosures. So the topic at hand is um, to, uh, we're going to do a one-stage or two-stage revision for a failed reverse. Uh, the good news is failure rates for reverses seem to be declining. Uh, if you look at uh, this review article, in early to, uh, failure rates were around 13 or even higher, and now in 2015 down to 6%. Uh, also, uh, Walsh and their group, even though it's a multi-center group, they found their complications, uh, the revision rate, at least for reverses, went from 23% down to 9%, and their complication rate sim similarly decreased to uh, down to 10%. In terms of uh, whether you're going to do this operation or not, uh, the learning curve for just even doing primaries is just 10 cases, and uh, for maybe 40 for others, it's kind of hard to say exactly, but I think uh, surgeon experience has definitely improved. I think most of us uh, that do many of these have gotten better at it and uh, aren't as many problems. The other thing that's real important, I think, is the survival of the implants. Fortunately, reverses have almost the same survival at five years, according to most systematic reviews, uh, compared to total solar arthroplasty. So again, as it's been emphasized previously, uh, it's really rewarding to help a lot of these patients that we couldn't help before. If you look at the longest term survival, though, uh, reverse total star arthroplasty in terms of systematic reviews is almost the same as um, those reported uh, for total shoulder arthroplasty. So uh, we, fortunately at uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, they haven't uh, started to fall apart completely, but at 15 years, the survival rate still is only 85%. So what, to, uh, what should, are the most common causes of failure of reverse total star arthroplasty? Uh, previously, back in 2007, it was just instability, which is quite a bit higher than it uh, is now due to uh, changes in the prostheses. But now it's down to only 4%. Infection uh, hasn't really changed a significant amount. Base plate failure, which uh, I think is the biggest um, uh, thing to deal with. And as I mentioned earlier, scapular fractures, which can be quite uh, debilitating, are uh, around 1% or 2% at the most. So if you have a, a, a reverse that's unstable at follow-up, uh, I think basically your options, uh, particularly if the system's too loose, you just increase the inserts. If you have improper version or inclination, then you're going to have to revise either the humerus or the glenoid. And if you have an infection, you're probably going to have to remove the humerus and the glenoid. So if you have an infection, uh, if it's an acute infection, then obviously just exchanging the components is going to be enough. If it's chronic, though, you have to decide if you're going to do a one- or two-stage revision. And uh, uh, our next speaker is going to address that, I think. Uh, but uh, again, you have to take out the components, which is uh, always a, a pain. So I'm going to deal with primarily base plate failure. Um, uh, John just dealt with um, how to deal with uh, failures of uh, not only anatomic replacements, but also uh, uh, reverses. Uh, I'm not going to really deal too much with the uh, Humoral side, I think most of us know what's involved with uh, revising or taking out stems or putting new ones in. But the major etiologies for base plate failure, number one, still remains infection. Aseptic loosening is around 1% to 2%. Osteolysis is uh, a looming threat, but fortunately has not proven to be a big factor. And then obviously you can have a fracture of the glenoid either due to uh, occasionally these acromial stress fractures or scapular stress fractures go to the base of the uh, implant or the patient just falls. So if you have a base plate loosening in reverse, here are your options. Number one is to do nothing and just leave it. The other is convert it to a hemiarthroplasty. Third is convert it to a spacer, particularly in infections. Uh, you can do a one-stage revision or you can do a two-stage revision. And looming on the horizon is uh, maybe custom glenoid components. So uh, why would you ever leave one in place? Uh, there's lots of reasons. One is the patient has no pain. Uh, they're kind of satisfied with the current situation. And believe it or not, uh, I have several patients like this who have just left it in. And oddly enough, it doesn't show so much in this x-ray, but as someone mentioned earlier, where they fail, the base plate tilts up and sometimes uh, gets sort of trapped in the subacromial space. And uh, oddly enough, uh, they don't really care. There are also patients who, for medical reasons, you just don't want to take them uh, back and the patient doesn't want another surgery. And obviously, the other thing to consider Whenever you're doing something like this, uh, it's, the revision risks are quite high, such as a patient like this who has a fairly uh, large BMI. So uh, the other thing you can do is you can convert it to a hemiarthroplasty, as in this patient. It gives pretty good pain relief. Uh, they will get sometimes reasonable function, but not in this case. Of course, uh, one of the reasons you put the reverse in is to prevent superior escape. 
And once you put in a hemi, you're usually back where you started. Oftentimes, the glenoid's not reconstructable. And then patient factors like this woman who's a drinker, and uh, we really decided not to go any further with her due to the complexity of any kind of revision. Uh, so uh, the next thing you can do is convert the reverse to a spacer. We usually do this in situations where there's infections like this. You can uh, put a spacer in as part of a one-stage, uh, two-stage procedure. Uh, some people get good enough pain relief that they don't want to do anything else. So we sometimes leave the spacers in. And I'm sure all of you have someone who's living on just a spacer. And some of them can actually have reasonable function, again, depending on how much superior subluxation they have. So um, you can also uh, uh, put one in and leave it if the glenoid is not reconstructable. Uh, there are obviously patient factors like recurrent infection or liver failure or whatever. And some people actually will tolerate these uh, as they function a little bit like a hemiarthroplasty. We looked at uh, 50 spacers. And uh, sometimes you're kind of forced, your hand's forced to do something. Uh, the complication rate uh, when our 50 was 28% and 8% fractured. Oddly enough, 6% of them spun around the other direction, which looks kind of weird. Uh, glenoid wear occurred in about 12% and required further surgery. And uh, humeral wear, as you can see in the patient on the one on the right, uh, sometimes it toggles and you can actually uh, get sort of looming humeral stress fractures or real fractures. Uh, so the indications uh, for revising a reverse to a reverse, uh, primarily you need aseptic loosening. Uh, obviously, I think with infection, and he's going to talk about it next, whether you one stage or two stage or infection. Uh, the other would be instability. Uh, humeral sided failure is quite rare, uh, but you need to have uh, fairly gl good glenoid bone. Unfortunately, uh, I think uh, there was a comment earlier about how much bone loss you get with a total versus a reverse. And I think in either situation, uh, depending on how loose the components are, you can have extensive bone loss with either type of prosthesis. But the bone loss with uh, loose reverse prostheses is pretty, pretty impressive and can uh, challenge you in a lot of different ways. So if you talk about one stage revision uh, from a hemiarthroplasty or total shoulder, which uh, he alluded to in the last uh, talk, the implant survivor is really pretty good. Uh, so it, uh, Two years, you have about a 92% survival, unfortunately down to about 75% at five years. And uh, they have fairly decent uh, function and uh, satisfaction rates fairly high. So using a reverse in that situation is uh, pretty straightforward. If you're going to re revise a reverse to a reverse, though, the most common cause, obviously, is uh, base plate loosening. And the biggest challenge is glenoid bone loss. I think, as we mentioned before, the humeral side concepts are fairly uh, r routine. The big thing is how you classify the bone loss. These are the types of defects you can see that uh, Frankel talked about back in 2009. And these are the ones that give you the real challenge. The B2s and Cs, most of us can deal with those, but it's these big, huge cavitary losses or rim losses that are the ones that are hard to deal with. Uh, Cofield and Sperling uh, published this in 2001. Also, just another illustration of the kind of defects you can have. But usually, in these instances, you're going to see the combined defects that are really quite extensive. So what are your options for the glenoid? One is a, a bone grafted. You can either one stage it or two stage it. Uh, for patients who have already an implant in, obviously, you're going to have to use allograft. Or you can use iliac crest. The difficulty with iliac crest is that many of these defects are so large that there's really no way to put in a iliac crest graft that's going to contain the defect. So Frankl did look at uh, using bone grafts in patients who were having primary uh, reverses. These are not revisions. And uh, he used humeral uh, autograft in 91%, which obviously would not be capable in a reverse to a reverse. And also 9% uh, got allografts. And uh, as mentioned earlier, he said 98% had graft uh, completion and there were no base plate failures. Uh, but his follow-up was quite short. I would venture to guess that over time, uh, those numbers changed. Uh, Cofield and uh, Sperling, uh, they looked at 41 patients. And uh, they uh, really tried hard to get at least two peripheral screws in the base plate to uh, have a good fixation. And uh, they had a minimum two-year follow-up. And they had good clinical outcomes, but they had a very believable graft resorption rate of around 23%. And admittedly, at their short-term follow-up, they didn't have any revisions, but that can obviously change over time. There was a systematic review looking at bone grafting defects, and this is really for uh, not only reverses, but totals. 
and they found that the graft union was 95 percent and revision required and only 2 percent. I still think that's a bit uh, optimistic, uh, but they did suggest that uh, when doing um, the uh, bone grafting that uh, concentric grafting did better than eccentric grafting. So my biggest issue really is uh, bone grafting the glenoid. I find it uh, very difficult. I also, uh, not only technically, but I, I have very hard time believing that allocrafts heal as well, well as everybody seems to say in the literature. And so I should probably go on another traveling fellowship and learn how to do it right. I think also when you're, unless you have navigation, the orientation of the screws when you're trying to revise these is very dodgy. And trying to get a screw and good bone is very difficult. And um, so I just think it's, I think it's very hard to do. So here's a patient who had a uh, failed reverse that was converted to a hemiarthroplasty. We did iliac crest bone graft, which uh, we sort of laid in there and put impacted uh, 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 cancellous bone as well. Unfortunately, it failed at uh, one year, and uh, he was perhaps a little bit worse off. Uh, so we used CT uh, modeling and went to a custom glenoid component in his case. You have to collaborate with the engineers, but you can see it's very difficult to bone graft a big cavitary defect like this. So uh, this is what we put in. Uh, these custom glenoid components are limited goals only. You have to slow, do slow rehab. This guy was a little bit exuberant, but uh, oddly enough, they get great pain relief and pretty good function. Uh, the bad news is that I saw this guy back uh, two weeks ago and his uh, glenoid's loose. So uh, custom glenoid components. Um, again, here's another patient that had uh, not a reverse, but a uh, failed uh, total. And you can see the uh, extensive glenoid bone loss on the right. Uh, we put in this uh, uh, prosthesis and it did quite well. There's only one published study looking at using these custom uh, things uh, just published last year from um, a group in, I think, in uh, the Netherlands. They had uh, 10 patients with severe defects. They didn't have any revisions um, and uh, everybody had uh, good outcomes. But again, this is very tentative and uh, I kind of, every time somebody comes in, after having one of these placed, I kind of very slowly look at the x-rays and hope that they're not falling out. So for a failed reverse, uh, you can do a one stage or you can do a two stage. It depends on your capabilities. It's certainly a very challenging problem. Um, there's all sorts of things you have to consider, not only just the etiology of why it's loose, but what the patient factors are, also how big the bone is, and uh, certainly they're evolving techniques of uh, what to do about these big, huge cavitary losses of bone in the glenoid. So there are many causes of reverse failure. Uh, glenoid bone loss, I think, is the major issue for me revising these. I usually do a one stage if they're not infected, a two stage uh, depending on what the, custom, what the uh, implant or the problem is. And uh, I think custom components offer a really great solution, but I don't think there's enough follow-up really to recommend them. So again, I want to thank everybody for having me here. This is a fantastic meeting, and I want to thank the, uh, the brothers for having us, and uh, also the faculty has been, I think, uh, really fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.